Hi everybody, welcome to A Course in Miracles Applied. Today's topic is called A Hope in the Darkness. And I'm going to try to combine two topics that we have already spoken about. One is kind of the journey with the course um, as a three-act structure. Um, and the other one is a topic that we did, I think, a couple of segments ago, which is um, based on the quote, um, but this you must remember, the attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God from the text, chapter 15, section 9. Um, I've been thinking about this for a while, and let's see if we can get this together. So, this story structure, right, is Obviously, we all have our stories, and obviously, also, each story is an illusion, right? We're not a story where the Son of God, um, our reality is far beyond any kind of story, obviously, right? Um, however, the Course basically comes in a mythological framework um, in somewhat of a story form. It tells the story of the Son of God, um, the separated Son of God that um, goes into the darkness and then has to find his way back home up the ladder, separation ladder down, as the Course says. So the story structure is a, a helpful tool until we can go past it. We cannot simply this reminds me of um, the, the Fellowship of the Rings, you know, when Boromir says you, you cannot simply go into Mordor. Um, you cannot simply stop being in your story. We can't just say, oh, I'm a story. I'm just going to stop being a story. I'm going to start being becoming aware of the Christ within me, the, the Holy Son of God. Right? If it would be that easy, we would it would already have happened and we would already be there. There's a reason why we are so identified with this story of ours, and the Course describes this as, um, in one of the quotes, it says, um, identification is salvation. We believe identifying with this body, this figure, this character in this world is our salvation and we can't just um, go past that and say okay no I'm not gonna identify with this story anymore so Jesus's way of dealing with this is using the story not to harm us but to help us to heal us so we use what we made to harm us which is this story of the Son of God that became an ego to heal us which means it's still a story, but this story will bring us to the gates of heaven, to the lawns of heaven, as the Course says, if we use it with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. So the story in itself isn't wrong. It is the ego's use of the story. And we have to realize, and that's part of this topic, we have to realize how massive our identification with this story is because we believe it will save us literally from the wrath of God. So let's talk about this three act structure. And as a disclaimer, this might be 100% my own ideas that might not have anything to do with what's actually going on. I can't know that if, if it has or not, right? I can only know that once I'm there and look back and say, okay, this was right, this wasn't, you know, whatever. Um, 
all I can do is hope that whoever's listening, whoever is uh, watching it, perhaps can find help, a helpful uh, bits and pieces in it for their own journey, right? So for your own journey. I think, and going back to the story structure, I think we're we're ending the the first age of the course. I think we are entering the second age of the course right now. Again, time is an illusion. However, as long as we believe in time, it's good to use it for our own progress, right? For forgiveness. Um, and then it will, it will keep gentle uh, pace with us. So I believe we're entering the second age of the course right now. What does, what does that mean? It means that, and the course says it itself, the course says this course is a beginning, not an end. That means everything in the course is a beginning. It is not the end. Um, the first age, which I'm, I'm, I'm thinking would be act one of our journey with the course, um, which roughly would be the first 50 years now that it has been on. Um, 72 to 2024, roughly 50 years, plus minus. Not that any of those numbers matter at all, right? This is just a concept. But I think it's important to realize <clears throat> that the first act, which I also think is parallel to the first four um, stages of the development of trust where we learn the basics we learn the concepts of the course we learn we start learning how forgiveness works um, we start learning that it's all, all everything happens in a relationship we start learning um, to put a little trust in Jesus and the Holy Spirit we're not really 100% sure yet what this is all for, um, but we're starting to find and integrate the course into our lives. And that is a very extremely important step. Without that step, any other thing that follows makes no sense. This is the foundation. I think this is Ken Wapnick's um, huge contribution, which would be this foundation that he taught with such love um, <clears throat> but he himself said that this is the beginning this is not this is not the end right so I think the first four stages of the development of trust are our act one the first age of the course in general because we have been with it now in this first age I think it'll switch within the next 10 years, I think it'll switch into this act too. Just in general, as, as a work, right? If, you, if we consider the course a spiritual work, what is its arc, what is its path? I think those first 50 years were the preparation. We're settling in, we're, we're getting comfortable with it. We're, we're remembering quotes, we're, we're applying as much as we can but that's not the end of the course, right? The first act, I believe, is when we can more or less, more or less follow what Jesus says. You know, when he says, see that we're all brothers, right? That we're all connected, that um, see the Christ in your brother. We get glimpses and we can feel that the course is right. Right, that it's telling the truth and we trust Jesus and we trust the Holy Spirit and we're on this path now. And what happens is, what I believe happens is that because we have, there's something, a, a, a counter force that prevents us from learning the course all the way at this stage, we cannot learn it all the way. This stage is the preparation stage. 
and we will realize that this was only a preparation when we get into this act two, which I believe is the fifth um, stage of the development of trust, when Jesus says that our goal of peace will be, um, we will not reach that goal for a long, long time. All right, this is act two. This is when I believe we get further and further into the ego thought system and it gets a little it gets darker and darker right we realize the more we work with the course the more we change from this act one to act two the more we realize how much we do not we are not able to do what jesus tells us to do we find ourselves unable to do what he says. See the Christ in your brother. The more we go into this act two, the more we realize I, I can't do it. Right? So act two is the fifth stage in the development of trust. That is the stage of undoing. Right? We're undoing the ego thought system the whole ego thought system. And then we get into act three and basically in act two, what I wanted to say also is that we don't, we can't really do what Jesus tells us in act one. We can kind of follow him. As I said, act two, we realize we cannot do what Jesus tells us to do. And then we lose hope and we close the book. And we say the course does not work. It might work for others. It does not work for me. And we don't realize that it is working 100%. We are being led into the darkness of the ego thought system. That is the only purpose of the course. To lead us through the darkness into Act 3. And Act 3 then, we will go back to slowly becoming or realizing that we can actually do what Jesus tells us to do, but we have a much deeper understanding in Act 3 because this is the consolidation phase. This is, this is the stage 6 in the um, development of trust when everything, all our, what we have learned is con being consolidated, right? And we're, we're single focused towards the peace of God. Right? We have left what we have gone through behind in Act 2. We're now in Act 3. We're still, we still think we're an individual, but now we're, it's lighter. Right? We're not, we don't believe we need to be an individual to, to escape God. We have, we have decided in general against the ego and for the Holy Spirit. And we're on this way in Act 3 to then are, we're able to do what Jesus tells us to do. When he says, you can see the Christ in your brother, we will see it. We will learn to see it in everybody um, because we have gone through this darkness of Act 2, this stage 5, right? So this is basically this, this uh, three, eight, uh, three act structure Personally, in our personal journey and also with the course at large, I think the first 50 years was to build the foundation upon which we then can do the actual work with the course, which is to go very deep into the ego thought system and look at it with Jesus and look at all the murderous thoughts and the judgmental thoughts and the abandonment thoughts and... Um, the special love relationship, the special hate relationship, look at all that with Jesus, go through that darkness. And that I'm not sure how long this is going to take, but it is definitely much longer than act one. I would say this could take, you know, in as a general number with the course could be 100 years, 150 years, 200 years, um, obviously past our own lifetimes. And then we go into act three of the course, which would be another maybe 
you know, 50 or so years. And then the arc of the course has ended and it has impacted us. And then something else will come along that change that has a different language that would um, be tuned in to the symbols of that time 300 years from now i'm really not th those numbers really don't matter what what i think matters though is that the act one if we understand that as the foundation then we don't lose hope in act two when when it gets tough if we think act one is the course that everything is love and joining in oneness, eventually we must go into this. Whenever we're ready, whenever the fear subsides enough, we will go into that act too. And it'll be much, much harder if we don't realize, okay, so the foundation, and then this is the work, and this is the act three where everything comes together. Okay, so this is the first part of this. Now, what do we do in the second act, right? And here's, I think, what, what we're going to do or what we are doing in the second act. As a, as a collective, in, as the arc of the course, and in our personal life. I came to the conclusion, and again, this is my own conclusion, this might not... I might be the only one thinking that, and that's okay, right? I think the sentence, the quote, but this you must remember, the attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God is the most important sentence in the Course. Nothing is more important than that sentence and what this sentence means. The attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God, right? The attraction of God is a constant. It is eternal. It is one. It is undivided. It is outside of time and space. It is love. It is peace. It is joy, right? It is what we call God. There's an attraction that's coming from that toward us the seemingly separated part of the Son of God. And if this would be the only thing that there is, right? If this wouldn't exist, then Act 1 would just go into Act 3, right? We start with the Course, we learn its concepts, we forgive, oh, the forgiveness is working, all is great. And we go into Act 3, where this attraction of God pulls us right back to God. And when we're in Act 1, we think actually that's what's going to happen. We think eventually, if I'm going to go go on like this, um, trying to love everybody, trying to forgive and such, trying to see the Christ in my brother, do what Jesus tells me to do, I will just automatically at some point be in that attraction of God will just pull me in. And as the Course says, God will take the last step. But then Jesus says, but this you must remember. The attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God. There is an active opposition that we have created, that we have miscreated, that we have made, that opposes the attraction of God. And the examination and looking at this opposition to God
that's act two of our journey. If there's an active opposition against the attraction of God that is there, always, always, always present. But we are not in this state. So according to the Course, we are actively opposing the attraction of guilt. We are attracted to guilt in all its shapes and forms, opposes the attraction of God. And the work of Act 2 in our lives, with the, in our life with the Course, in our spiritual process here, is the examination in painful detail of the attraction of guilt. The opposition to the attraction of God is the work of Act Two. Okay, you can see it. Smiley face. So Ken, Ken said in one of his tapes, he said, don't work on it. And it, it threw me off because I'm kind of a worker, worker, a spiritual worker bee. Um, but I understood what he meant, you know, don't work on it. But still, this is the work we need to do. We need to look at the attraction guilt has to us in all its forms and shapes. And then we look at it with Jesus and we don't do anything about it. Right. That's what he says. Don't work on it. We need to look at the attraction of guilt with Jesus and then we don't do anything else, right? That's the forgiveness process. We look and wait and we judge not. So we look at Jesus and all this, the, all this, the, the whole attraction of guilt, which is the whole text, basically 50% of the text in the Course are explaining in very, very painful detail our attraction to guilt that we see in our brother, in ourselves, in the world. And this guilt is, has, takes as many facets, many, many different shapes and forms. And that is the opposition to the peace of God, right? When, when Jesus says um, in lesson 189, I think, I want the peace of God. 185, right? When he says, I want the peace of God to say these words is nothing, but to mean these words is everything. That's what he means, right? To say these words, I want the peace of God, that is a, that is an aspect of act one. We, we get to know the course and we say, I want the peace of God. Of course I do, right? When we slip, slide into Act two, we realize, wait a minute, if I want the peace of God and I don't have it, what's going on? Why do I not have it if I want it? And then Jesus tells us to me to say these words is nothing. We say the words, I want the peace of God here. It is nothing. To mean these words is everything. And to mean it is here. I want the peace of God Yes, we do want the peace of God, the consolidation of all the concepts we've learned, single focus towards the peace of God. I want the peace of God. Yes, no more opposition. Act three, we have mostly gone past all the opposing power. But act two in our work is deals with the attraction of guilt. And if we think this is a happy place, a happy time, we will be very much mistaken and we will not continue on this journey. We will stop this, this whole thing altogether because it gets too dark. That's why 
I think it's helpful to have this concept to realize, okay, this is all good, but this can't be everything because I do not have the peace of God yet. And the peace of God means an, an experience of an undescribable love, right? That we simply don't have. We, we have glimpses here and there. And we have not yet gone into this attraction of guilt to come out and realize, okay, we are past this opposition, right? Now I can truly say and mean I want the peace of God. In Act 1, I, I, I say it. In Act 2, I realize I do not want it at all. I do not want the peace of God. I do not want to see the Christ in my brother. I want to be, the further we come here, the more we realize I don't want to go in this direction at all. I want to go back. I want to go back to the blue pill in the matrix. I want to go back. I don't want to go, I don't want to go this way. The further we go into act two, the bigger this opposition seems to be getting. It's not getting bigger, but become we become more aware of it, right? We become aware of how deeply rooted our wish not to have peace is, not to see our brother as the same as us. That's why we're in here somewhere and we realize I can't do anything Jesus tells me in this course, nothing. He, t he says something beautiful language. I'm like, I, I can't do it. And then we think something's wrong with us, right? That's where the, the darkness comes in and the hopelessness sets in. Because if we, if we, uh, we give our lives to this book, right? More or less, but we, we, we do our best. We, we go with it. We read it. We do whatever Jesus tells us to do. We try to do it. And then we come to a point here in the middle and we realize anything that I thought I learned here in this act one is completely out the window. I don't love my parents, right? I don't love my, the people around me. If I would love them, this love would expand to everything and everybody. If it doesn't, it's not the love that is Jesus is talking about in the attraction of God. This is what he's talking about is the special love relationship of the ego, which is part of the attraction of guilt. Chapter 15, 17, 21, 23, it all talks about the special love and special hate relationship, it goes very deep into it. And one major factor of that is the, this attraction that we have to guilt as the opposing force to the attraction of God. So we must realize that the work of the Course is not in Act 1, right? The work of the Course is to examine and look at how much we do not want to have anything to do with Jesus or the Holy Spirit or God. Nothing. And if we get to that point of realizing, Jesus, I don't want to be with you, he says, congratulations, you now have entered level two of this game. Because now I can work with you. As long as you tell me you love me, as long as you think you're going towards God and everything is fine, you just have to go around a couple of obstacles, nothing will happen because the attraction of guilt opposes and there's one thing we really should write down here opposes in secret the attraction of god the attraction of guilt opposes in secret the attraction of God. We have no clue of the of, of the deeply rooted belief in this.
And as long as we think our feet touch the ground, as long as we believe the person we're looking at in the mirror in the morning experientially is us, we are not here. We are somewhere here. The more we realize how much we are identified with the body, that is all part of, of part two. Right? The, this identification is salvation will be very closely examined in, in act two. How deep our identification with this body, with this personality, with this individual being, with this world is. Right? In act one, we think it's relatively easy to, oh yeah, I'm identification is salvation, but I can I can get out of it. In act two, we realize there's we can't get out of it. We will eventually, but it seems like we cannot get this identification with the body is very, very strong. With this world, with all the rules of this world, with with the laws of physics, right? We still believe in gravity, right? We can't float two feet above the ground. We are identified with this world and this body and this personality because the attraction of guilt is what roots us in it. So where is the hope in all of this, right? Because this gets pretty hopeless. I mean, I'm... I'm uh, a good a good number of you know of what I speak. And Jesus tells us, you know, you know what I'm talking about. When he says in lesson 182, I will be still an instant and go home. He says, no one but knows whereof we speak. He says, listen, I, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, but you won't let this come up because it's painful. This is a painful process, right? Yet some try to put by their suffering in games they play. We can play games in Act 1 with the Course and say this is a phenomenal path. It's beautiful. The language is beautiful. It's all about love. And we're so desperate for it. We, we cling to it like, a, like a, a, a drowning person to a, one of those things, right? Lifesavers. And then we think that's it because we're too terrified to go into this, right? To look at the attraction of guilt means I have to look at the belief that I killed God. It's not something we want to do, right? He says, yet some try to put by their suffering in games they play to occupy their time and keep their sadness from them. In Act 2, this sadness will come back. We have repressed it and put layers and layers and layers of defenses over this pain. It must come back when we uncover the attraction of guilt, all its defenses that we put over it to not see it will come back. Others will deny that they are sad and do not recognize their tears at all. Still others will maintain that what we speak of is illusion, not to be considered more than but a dream. Yet who in simple honesty without defensiveness and self-deception, would deny he understands the words we speak. We speak today for everyone who walks this world, for he is not at home. We're not at home here. In Act 1, we still think this world, even though we can intellectually say, yeah, we're not, we're not here. This is an illusion. Experientially, we say, ah, I don't want to hear that. In Act 2, we realize, I do not want to hear that. This is too terrifying to, to hear that this is an illusion. Because we've made all this with a huge purpose. 
The purpose of the illusion is to escape God, the wrath of God. And we, leave, we believe that with every fiber of our being. That's why we made all this, the whole universe, we made as a defense against this belief that we killed God. And for us to say this is just an illusion is, does nothing, right? In Act 2, this will be when we realize the attraction of guilt is that it actually opposes in secret this attraction of God we will work through this with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit together. We will look at all of this and over time decide more and more for the presence of Jesus or the Holy Spirit within us. But we have to go through that belief in this, in this massive attraction of guilt. So... Where is that hope now? Because this act two is not a hopeful act. This is hopeful because we're excited about it. This is hopeful because we know we're going to be there. This is not hopeful. It has hopeful moments, but in general, this is not a very hopeful we, we get we, we will start to get a baseline of hope that increases over time. But as this baseline of hope increases, the terror of this also increases. So where is the hope in, in this process? And... The hope lies in the fact that, and that is, that is very strange, it is a very counterintuitive thought, but if we realize that the only way we can go from here to here, to this, to this love of God, to this peace, to our home, right? is to go through the attraction of guilt. Then, if we're in the midst of it, if we are, we find ourselves in, in absolute terror or we realize, I don't want to forgive anybody, right? We're in the, we're in the darkness, whatever, however this is for each of us, right? It's, it's, all, it's all different, but it's all the same. Right? We're in this darkness. If we realize that the only way to get to the love of God, to this experience of peace, is through this, then whenever we're in it, we, real, we can realize we're on our way. We're not stalling. Even though we're, we're massively... Our resistance seems unsurmountable. Our judgments seem incredibly vast and big. Right? We can never give up our judgments. Right? We're in this phase of utter darkness. But if we realize that the way from through the to, to the peace of God is through the darkness, then the hope lies in this looking at the darkness the looking at the darkness the experience of this darkness then becomes a hopeful endeavor because we know we must go through it to the other side in act three when we then experience the attraction of god That is the hope. The hope in the darkness is that the darkness now is no longer a secret opposing force that we have no clue about. It is a very openly examined 
still very painful and intense time but it is the way through to the other side and without going through it we cannot get to this right because if the attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of god we must do something with the attraction of guilt right if this is an active opposition we must do something with it and in this line that we said before but this you must remember the attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of god the next sentence is his attraction for you remains unlimited but because your power being his is as great as his you can turn away from love right our power is as great as god's and we're using this power to oppose in secret this attraction of god and this act too is there to uncover all the ways we oppose this attraction of god if we're in a room filled with people in act one i remember in act one it was relatively easy to love everybody now i'm like get me out of here you know <laughs> 20 minutes and i'm gone right or i want to leave or sometimes it's better sometimes it's worse but it is definitely i can feel this opposition because the love in the room is there if i don't feel it i must oppose it actively at this very moment right so I can look at this opposing power that I gave the power to. And over time learning, looking with Jesus at it, I can learn to give it less and less and less power. But there's no way to get from act one to act three other than through act two. Which is the full acknowledgement that I give my power that is the same as God's to opposing the attraction of God. I think that's all I wanted to say today. And um, I hope it's, it is helpful. It is helpful for me to, to tell you about it because it makes it clear once again and it, it deepens my understanding of it too so i thank you so much for watching